If you got your Bible, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 15 this morning. John chapter 15. Uh, we've been kind of in this flow and in this vein of faith. Somebody shout faith. I really felt so strong over the last several weeks and the last few months with everything happening in the earth today. Uh, this war that's going on, that's been going on for a month now, uh, the things that have gone on the last couple of years with this pandemic and uh, things that have went through, we've gone through with political things and still in the midst of those th kind of things. And just the current events that are happening in the earth today with gas prices and the, the talk of shortages and food shortages and just all kind of crazy things that the enemy has used a lot of this stuff to try to put fear even in the people of God. And fear, uh, fear tries to counteract our faith, and, and, and a lot of times you can be experiencing fear in your life, but press through that fear and still walk in faith. That a lot of times, uh, fear is not really the opposite of faith, that doubt is the opposite of faith. When we doubt God, when we don't believe God, there's been a lot of things that I've done, I, I've did when I was afraid. When God called me into ministry school, and the ministry school that I went to was a very practical ministry school that we got teaching in the classroom, but in the afternoon, we went out into the inner, inner cities. We went and knocked on doors. We went to the malls and prayed for people and all the things that we did. Uh, you know, a lot of times I was afraid when I went out and did those things. I, I remember being from Habersham and, uh, you know, being from a, a small town and going into the city and God moving me into the city, a place that I never wanted to go to because I thought if I went to the city, I would die. I would get mugged. Somebody would stab me, shank me, shoot me. I don't know. All that you could think of, I thought it was going to happen to me. And there were boogeymans in the city. There were people that will rob you. There were people that will steal your lunch money. There were people that you just need to look out. All the bad people are in the city. How many know there's bad people in the country too? You know, there is evil everywhere. But I had this mindset that if I went where, where there was more than a two-lane road, I was going to die. You know, there was a lot of fear. And, uh, but I went in faith believing that God had called me. And I went on a journey, even though there was kind of some fear in my life. I still believe that God was calling me there and that if I would walk by faith and not by sight, God would carry me through whatever happened in my life. And I remember meeting an evangelist, many of you know him, Johnny Jernigan. I met Johnny Jernigan and he began to teach us, if they beat us up, God will heal you. And if they kill you, you will be with God. So what is the worst thing that they could do to you? And he would have a pep rally with us when we would be in churches. We would, as our ministry team and our, 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 our program that we were in, we would travel all over the southeast, all, all the way as far as to Texas. And we would help local churches do outreaches and evangelize in their community. And he would always give us this pep rally, the whole church. He would try to get us built up in faith. If they beat us up, God will heal you. And if they kill you, you will be with God. Very encouraging, right? <laughs> And he would encourage us in, in those things. But there was still fear in my life. Am I going to get bit by a dog? And then I began to understand my authority that I really do have authority in the spiritual realm. And if I will not show the dog fear and I will put my hand out. That was another thing we learned. We put our hand out. When he comes up to sniff your hand, you draw back and punch him in the nose and he'll run off. I think I need to have, an, uh, after this healing course, we're going to have a Bible school on evangelism too because healing and evangelism really go good together. And there are some techniques that God has given us over the years, and there are some biblical spiritual techniques too in sharing your faith and that kind of thing. And so I'll never forget, even in ministry school, we went into the inner city for the first time. And listen, I've always been very athletic. I've always, uh, you know, uh, I, I played football until I got in high school. And then I got a job because I wanted a car and all this kind of stuff. But I've always enjoyed working out and being in the gym and all this kind of stuff. And I go to ministry school. And I, I mean, I'm not... I'm not saying this to brag or anything, but everybody's like trying to look at my muscles and stuff. And I'm like, man, I'm in ministry school. You know, what are y'all doing? Like the dudes are like, what's up, man? How much you bench and everything else? I was like, I'm not here about bench pressing or anything else. I'm here about the word of the Lord. 
So here I am, uh, this muscular dude in the inner city with this uh, little bitty girl that's in our ministry school, and she is pounding on the doors trying to evangelize, and I'm over here in the corner <laughs> like, hey, go ahead, you can knock on the door, I'll stand back here and pray. But I went in faith believing even though there was some fear in my life. And the more I walked in faith, the more fear began to bow. Listen, the more you will walk in faith and build your faith, fear will begin to bow in your life. It will begin to bow in your life when the current events and the things that are happening in the earth and when gas prices are this and we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know about shortages and all these things. If we will build our faith in the God that is faithful, if we will build our faith in a place of not just what can I get from you, God, but if I live in intimacy with you and worship you and feed on your faithfulness, I know that no matter what happens, no matter how high the creek rises. No matter what happens in the earth, God is faithful and he will not leave his children begging for bread. The Bible says God, the Bible says, actually I think it was David that said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. And God wants to, God wants to supply everything that we need because even in the midst of a crazy world, in a crazy society, in a crazy world, uh, War torn, you know, gas prices, the uncertainty. There is a certainty that God will always take care of his children. And we must encourage and strengthen ourselves in the faith. So, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about this thing of faith. And uh, I, I felt that in my heart that we just need encouraged. We need encouraged to run the race. We need encouraged to go deeper in the things of God. We need encouraged to build our faith that no matter what's happening in the earth, God can do anything. God can do anything. When you seek God first and His righteousness, you will never miss a house payment. Oh, that's pretty bold, Pastor, that you would say that. When you seek God first and his righteousness, he said, all things shall be added unto you. Well, what if I miss a house payment and I don't have my house anymore? God will provide you another house. God will do anything and everything to make sure that his children are taken care of. God will make sure that we get what we need. We see it all throughout the Bible. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And even when his children were wandering around in the desert, when they were stiff-necked, and Moses was ascending the hill of the Lord and being in the glory of God. And the children of Israel were, were going back and just wanting to go back to the place of bondage. Oh, it was better here. It was better there. No, God has a better way, a plan, and a purpose. And if we will seek him first in everything, he will add all things to us. And we have to build ourselves and build our faith in that area and be encouraged in the place of faith. Because people say, what's this world coming to? This world's just going to hell. But God is looking for a church that will walk in faith to see his kingdom come and his will be done. When everything else is falling apart, the army of God should be rising up. When everybody else is suffering defeat, do we serve the living God who knows no defeat? The one who fights all our battles for us. When we are laying in the bed and we are afraid and fearful of defeat, will we meditate and feed on the faithfulness of God that He is the victorious warrior? That He is the God of victory? That we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us? And so last week we began to talk about this thing of feasting and prayer. We talk about fasting and prayer, but, but I felt in my heart that the Lord wanted me to talk about this thing of feasting and prayer. Because we need to be feasting on the Word of God. And we cannot eat just one meal a week in the natural. And if we're going to walk in everything that God has for us and live in the peace that God has for us, we're going to have to eat more than one meal a week or a couple of times a month when we think it's convenient to go to church and we feel like it. You, you go to church even when you don't feel like it. Anyway... I didn't feel like it because the wind was howling at my house this morning. Anybody else had the howling wind at your house this morning? About 3 o'clock. And my wife said it this morning in prayer. She couldn't sleep, so if she can't sleep, I can't sleep. 
We are one. She pulled a Bible out on me. I'm like, I think you're taking that out of context, woman. <laughs> Go to sleep. She's walking around the house looking at her flowers outside and her tree fell over and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just trying to get some sleep. I don't even know where I'm going with this. Yes, she said, we are one. If I'm not sleeping, you're not sleeping. I don't even know why I'm saying this. <laughs> oh, yeah. You go to church even when you feel like it because when my alarm went off after I finally went back to sleep, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't feel like coming to church. I didn't feel like praying. I didn't feel like praying. I didn't feel like praising. But you know what I did? I said, you know what? I have to be there. <laughs> I did say that too. She, Anastasia said, you know, I'm really tired. But before you say anything, I'm going to church. I'm looking at her sideways, and I'm like, yes, we are one. You are going to church. I'm going to pull the Bible out on me. I'm going to pull the Bible out on you. So we're getting ready, and I didn't feel like praying, didn't feel like praising, didn't feel like coming, didn't feel like preaching. But you know what I told my flesh? Not only do I have to be there, I really want to be there. And when I started stepping in faith, my flesh began to dwindle, and I began to feel the Spirit of the Lord. And there's no place I'd rather be than with the people of God, because we need each other. For what's coming in the earth. We need each other. We need to be equipped. We need to be ready. We need, you need to be equipped in your marriage. That's why we have a marriage class. You need to be equipped in healing. You need to be equipped in evangelism. You need to be equipped in these kind of things. And I feel in my heart. I didn't even know I was going to say this. But I feel in my heart. There's an acceleration of equipping coming. And God is showing us what it's looking like. And we're going to begin to walk in it. But if you don't come and show up. You're missing out. We're not doing this just to try to fill the building or get another building or anything else. We're doing this because we are here to fulfill the will of heaven. And the will of heaven is not that any should perish, but all should come to the place of repentance. The will of heaven is the, the blind should see. The will of heaven is the broken heart should be healed. The will of heaven is that we are to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, cast out demons, speak in new tongues. The will of heaven is that we would fulfill the commission of the Lord. And the commission is to go into all the world and preach this gospel and it begins right here where we are and I feel by the spirit of the Lord there is an acceleration of equipping and a confidence coming to the house of God to begin to receive the harvest that God is bringing in I feel that this isn't just something preachy but God is saying stop talking about getting ready and get ready I can't get you ready but you must get ready yourself by siding in in with a plan in the house of God. You say, how do I get ready? You get ready by getting planted in the house of the Lord. You get ready by getting in the secret place of God. You get ready by getting in the word of God. If you don't make church, you better not miss your appointment with God. If you don't make the next event that we have, you better not miss your appointment with God morning, noon, and night. Because the way to get ready is to get up and begin to move forward forward in the things of God. It is time we move forward in the things of God. You know what? It, it, I, and, and I will do it till Jesus comes back. But sometimes I'm like, Lord, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. But it seems like nobody really wants to get ready. It seems like people are too occupied with their pain. It seems like people are too occupied with the lies of the enemy. It seems like we're too occupied with the cares of the world and the cares of this life. Because even pastor has been there before. And there are things that try to keep us so occupied that what we do is put God, his agenda on the back burner to try to fulfill our own self desires and our own security. And can I tell you something? There is no security in a 401k. There is no security in the things of the earth. Yes, you should save. You should prepare. You should get ready for retirement, but not at the expense of sowing and living in the kingdom way. Because when everything in this earth begins to crumble, there is a kingdom that will not crumble. And you want to make sure you're laying up treasures not on earth where moth and rust do corrupt, but you're laying up treasures in heavenly because a lot of people are trying to withdraw somewhere they've never deposited. And it's a time to get ready. 
how we get ready is feasting on the Word of God and realizing that I don't just read my Bible to read my Bible. I feast on the Word of God. People say, Pastor, did you read the Bible in a year? I'm going to be honest with you. No, I didn't read the Bible in a year. Because I, 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 I'm more, I don't read the Bible for the volume of how much I can read the Bible. Sometimes God puts me in a passage of Scripture and I may be there a month reading it over and over, meditating on it, praying it over and over and over again. And there's nothing wrong with re- reading the Bible and checking off a Bible reading plan. Many of us need to do that. But I'm just saying that a lot of times we can read the Bible with a religious attitude just to check off a list when we need to be feasting on the Word of God. It amazes me how much that even as a pastor, you've got to come up with another revelation. And pastor, we've been talking on that for too long and too much. And how long are we going to talk on that? Well, what if we talked on it till we all got it and started doing it? Maybe, maybe if the Lord said, listen, you don't move off that till you start doing that. Because a lot of people are waiting on God to tell them to do something. And they haven't done the last thing God told them to do. And we wonder, why ain't God talking and God's just silent? Well, maybe you need to do what he told you to do last. Lord, I should have got some more sleep. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I should have got some more sleep. And we've got to feast on this word. We've got to meditate on this word. This word has to become precious again. It's got to become precious again. Precious again. We were in prayer this morning, and that was the prophetic direction of the Lord, that we would just fall in love again, fall in love with the Word. Listen, when you fall in love with Jesus, you fall in love with the Word because He was the Word made flesh. And in Matthew chapter 4, we talked about this last week, that Jesus said this. We all know this scripture. When Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and the enemy came to tempt Jesus, In Matthew chapter 4, when the enemy came to him, in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said this. He answered and he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And as the body and the bride of Christ, we've got to learn to feast on the word again. Feast on the word again. Feast, feast, feast on the word again. Not just every now and then, every single day of our life. It may be one scripture until you get victory in that area. Until you get victory in that area, you don't stop feasting on it. If you've got an anxiety or a fear problem, you find out what the Bible says about fear, and you feast on that word until you get victory. You don't let that word go. You don't doubt that word. You don't say, well, that didn't work. I tried it for a couple of hours. No, you stand on that word. If it takes a week, if it takes a month, if it takes days, because there is victory in the word of God. God watches over his word to perform it. But what do we do so many times? Oh, that didn't work, and oh, I tried that. But let me tell you something. The word will work if you will work the word. You can't grow weak and weary in working the word. And you've got to, if you need healing in your body, you know what? You need to get a hold of the word of the Lord. And you need to feast and meditate and get that word in your mind, in your heart, in your being. You need to be saturated with the word of God. And hold on to that word until you see victory. And never give up and give in. Because when you feel like giving up and giving in, you better be planted in the right place that people will come around you and say, listen, I know you feel weary right now, but we're about to hold up your arms. Don't you doubt the word and the promise of God. Don't you give up on the word and the promise of God. Don't you ever doubt what God has promised you because God will bring it to pass and you need to be planted in the ground of his word and in the house of the Lord where people come alongside you and hold up your arms till we see that victory. It is his word. It is his promise. He said, listen, you can't live by bread alone. That's why it's important that the body and the bride feast on the word. Feed our spirit. Feed our, feed our faith. The word, I said this last week. I want to say it again. The word is more important than your morning vitamin. It is more important than your protein shake. It is more important than your prescription drugs. I'm not saying don't take that stuff. I'm just saying that whenever you take that prescription drug, you need to, when you put it in your mouth, you need to take it by faith and say, God, I thank you that I will have no side effects from this in the name of Jesus. God, thank you that I take this by faith and I believe that I'm not even going to need this in the near future. I believe that I'm not even going to need this, that I'm going to go back to my doctor and they're going to say, wow, I'm amazed at what has happened in your blood pressure. I'm amazed at what's happened in your diet. I better be, be I'm in your sugar levels or whatever. I am amazed at what God is doing in your life. 
It's more important than our vitamins. It's more important than the things of the earth. Why? Faith is the ability to believe and receive what God has already done. And we said this last week. I just want to say it again. I believe it bears repeating. Our problem is not that we don't have faith. God has already given us the measure of faith. Our problem is we think wrong about God and the ways of God. The problem is we think wrong about God and the ways of God. Do you know there's a lot of people that won't come through a church because they think God will strike them dead? I used to be that. That's serious. That's, some people joke about that, but that's a real thing for some people. They, they really believe that they are not worthy, and we are not. But they, they believe that if I could just get over this addiction and this habit, then, then maybe God would accept me. No, God accepts you with your addiction and your habit. And when you yield to Him and come to Him with your addiction and your habit, and you really yield to Him, He will empower you to break that addiction and that habit off your life. He will change your taste buds. He will change your desires. He will change what you want in your life. Why? Because it's not our modification of our behavior and our own self-willpower not to do something that we shouldn't do. It is the very transforming power of the Word of God. It is getting our mind transformed by the Word of God that we don't want to do the same thing we used to do. And what happens is we think wrong about God. We approach God the wrong way. And we got we to be transformed. The scripture says that we are transformed. I said it last week. That transform means to change after being with. To change after being with. Get ready. Get ready for drug addicts. Don't get nervous when they walk through the doors. Don't get nervous when you see them in the aisle at Walmart. And you want to shift down the other aisle because you don't want to encounter them. No, the glory of God wants to come in Walmart. And, and God wants to save people right in the middle of Walmart. And then you bring them to the house of God and they get planted. And then the army and the kingdom of God is growing because more are going out. As many as coming in are going out. That many times we pray God send them from the north, south, east, and west. And yes, God will send them in. But we need to send them out to the north, south, east, and west. That God doesn't want to just bring us in so that we can be fat and be merry and just go through a religious routine. No, when we come into this place, we are to pursue God in the corporate place and with all that we have, be encouraged, be in strength, and hear the word of God, and then go out into the harvest field and reap the harvest. That's not the pastor's job solely. That is the church's job to equip the saints, what, for the work of the ministry. And you know what I believe we've done over the years? I heard a sermon this week, and it, it went off in my spirit like crazy. Over the years, and they didn't say it just like this. Pastor Drew heard this sermon. He might, he might know what I'm talking about. They didn't say it just like this, but it went off in my spirit. For all these years, I don't know how many years, the years that I've been alive, we've tried to make the church appealing to the world. We've tried to dumb down the gospel, and we can't talk about tongues, and we can't take time to pray for healing for people because we don't want to offend the lost people, and we're trying to get lost people in here. What we need to do is make sure that we give them a t-shirt, and there's nothing wrong with giving people a t-shirt, giving them a free gift. We give people a free gift and everything else. We need to do this, and we need to do that to try to get lost people in here. But the church is to be the house of the Lord where we put him number one, and we go out there to get lost people saved. Instead of trying to dumb down the house of God and say we can't offend people or step on anybody's toes or this or that, or they may not come back, or they may not understand. They may not understand all that worship, Pastor, so you better not worship over about ten minutes, and you better not do certain things and this and that. And we've dumbed down church. We've dumbed down the house of worship, and we've made it all about everybody else but God. I mean, have we ever stopped to think about that? Have we ever just stopped to think about that this, what we're doing inside these walls, is for Him? It is to honor Him. It is to come together at least one day a week, the first day of the week, Sunday. And I know, I mean, there's billboards of people forcing people to worship on the Sabbath. Like, there is just stuff out there that is trying to cause so many, so much confusion in the earth today. Jesus is our Sabbath. Come on, somebody. We get religious about a day. What? I should have slept. You should have let me sleep, girl. It's her fault. Her fault. Her fault. It's all your fault. We 
we get caught up in all this religious stuff, these religious rules, and we make church. Church, we know, is not even a building. People argue that. I ain't gotta, I, I'm a part of the church, and I ain't got to go to the church. I'm saved, and I don't got to go to the church. Well, the church is really you and I if you're born again. But the Bible does, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves as a manner of some. But to come together, why? To exhort each other, to encourage each other. To be equipped, to move forward in all that God has for us. To reach that harvest that's out there. I just believe that even some of us in here today are going to begin to catch a vision that you are important to the harvest. That you're going to begin to catch a vision that right now you just, man, these kids, if I, can, if, I can just, if I can just get through another day of these kids. Come on, how many of us all been there? We love our kids. They're like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. We keep feasting and telling ourselves that. And sometimes, I said it a few weeks ago, sometimes just give your wife a break. Just take the kids and let the, let the wife go get coffee with a friend or something. I know you've been working all day and, 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 and you provide her. But let me tell you something. You're not just to provide the money. You provide the word of the Lord and the covering over your wife. If that means you got to sacrifice a few hours in the evening and eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich so your wife can get a little bit, a little bit of time, that might be okay every now and again. And then when your husband comes home from a hard day's work, give him a few minutes by himself before you just man bombard him. Just let him breathe. We just got to be there for each other. We got to discern it and be there for each other and cover each other and help each other. Maybe I need the marriage class. <laughs> Let's just do a marriage class for all of us. <laughs> I'm just playing. Feasting on the word of the Lord. I got to wrap this up. I didn't even get to my scripture. John, John chapter 15. This is the text that I felt the Lord put in my heart for today. John chapter 15. These are the words of Jesus. Are they in red in your Bible? These are the words of Jesus. He says this. He says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. More fruit, y'all. More fruit. And some of us, I believe, are going to catch a vision. Yes, I believe some of us are going to catch a vision of the importance you are to the kingdom of the Lord. I, don't, I can't pray like so and so and... Some of you may even feel intimidated to come to prayer. Can I tell you, that's a lie of the devil. That's a plan of the enemy. You ain't got to pray like nobody else as long as anybody else. Listen, for some of us, you just need to come and sit in the back in the atmosphere of prayer. I can tell you this. When I went to ministry training school, I didn't know nothing about the Holy Ghost. I was hungry for God, and I was intimidated by all these people that were praying all these prayers. But you know what I did? I sat in the presence of the Lord. In the corner of a chair on the back row by myself, soaking it in. Transformation comes with who you're with. And the more I sat there, the more God began to change my heart and change my life. And there would be times that in ministry school, our, the youth ministry that we were a part of at Victory World Church began to experience this move of God. It was in 2001, 2002. And I don't even know if they're popular anymore, but there used to be this popular magazine called, called Charisma Magazine. Charisma came in and wanted to do an article because we were, we were having these extended meetings that came out of a time of prayer, just having a prayer meeting. And youth were getting saved and adults were coming in and people were getting healed, people were getting delivered. I remember my first experience of seeing somebody get a demon cast out of them. People don't even believe in that stuff today. That's a whole other course we need to have on demonology and spiritual warfare so that you understand. That's in the future. But I'm just saying that I began to see people get delivered and get set free from bondages. And I remember that 
I had the, I got on a schedule uh, being in master's commission that after everybody left that I would lock the door. I was on the schedule to make sure all the lights were off and lock the door. And I remember that it would be a long time sometimes. It would be 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night. People, we'd just leave them in the altar. Doesn't kick them out, didn't disrupt them. Let, let, they call me Habs. Let, let Habs close. He can stay here. Everybody else going on home. But there came a hunger in my heart that I just wanted to linger there. There's people in the altar laying in the altar, and people get up, start getting up one by one by one. And there would even be times after everybody left, I would lock the door and I would just sit there a few minutes longer because God was doing something so special. And I would just say, God, I know this is more than an event. This is your presence and your spirit moving. And I remember that even Joshua in the Bible, the Bible says that he would linger in the presence of the Lord. He would stay there. He would linger. And what we've, What's happened in our society today, we've come, become so desensitized to the presence and the power of God that it's become such a religious routine. That even for years, we haven't even taught it or demonstrated it in the house of God. And we wonder why our nation is in the state it's in. You, can't, you can blame it on a political party. You can blame it on a person. You can blame it on a president. You can blame it on a Supreme Court justice. You can blame it on your mama. You can blame it on your dad. You can blame it on anybody you want to. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus came and he died to put the church in the earth to occupy until he comes. And it doesn't mean there's not going to be heartache and disappointment and wars and rumors of wars and all those kind of things. But you know what? Even in the midst of tragedy, we don't know how to bring people to the throne of grace. And Jesus was saying here, he said, there is more fruit to be bore. That there is more fruit that you are to be bearing. In verse 3, he said, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Well, I'm not, Pastor. Look what I'm doing and look what I did and look at this habit and look at this hang-up. Well, he's already shed his blood to cleanse you from all of that. you got to come to him with every hook-up, every hang-up, and every, everything that's going on in your life because he's already shed his blood once and for all to cleanse you from all things. He said, listen, I've already cleansed you. Are you going to walk in the filthiness or are you going to choose life? Well, this is what my grandpapa did and my great-grandpapa did. And, you know, we just got this habit and we'll just always have this habit and everything else. No, it can stop with you through the blood of the Lamb. Let me finish the scripture and i got to close. Verse 4, this is so important. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus was saying, listen, the lasting fruit, the fruit in your finances, the fruit in your marriage, the fruit in your health, the fruit in your retirement plan, the fruit in your life, you cannot bear everlasting fruit apart from me. And what we've done is we've separated. We separate church and state. We separate, uh, you know, we separate this compartment with that compartment. I separate my business from the kingdom. Uh, this is this over here. And I, I separate my ball with my kids and my basketball and my t-ball and my baseball. And I just have all these little compartments. And, yeah, if I get to the compartment of the church, I'll get there when I get there. And we separate all these things. But it is in Him that everything we do, it is in Him that that we live and we move and we have our being. When we're preparing for our future, when we're saving for our retirement, when we're raising our kids, when we're teaching them disciplines with sports, everything in our life is to be in Him. And if there's ever anything that begins to take our priority away from Him, He will tell us, hey, you need to set that aside. Well, all kids should be doing this or all kids should be doing that. No, everyone should be doing what the Spirit of the Lord is is leading us to do. He says, if you abide in me and I in you, as he abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He's talking about this fruit. He says this in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit. 
For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and it is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me, this word abide means remain. It doesn't mean you visit. That's why a lot of times as a pastor, we're just trying to get people to come to church. But you know what? If you will be, begin to abide in the Word of God, coming to church won't be an issue for you. And a lot of times we get it all backwards. If I could just get somebody to church, get somebody to church. And it's important because you are better off in here than you are out there on a Sunday morning because you will have the opportunity to catch something, hear something, receive something, get some impartation into your life. And that is very important. Church attendance is very important, but there's some people sitting in church far from God. There's some people that sit in church that never grow and mature in the things of God. There's a lot of people that sit in the pew for 30 and 40 years, and what do they do? They cause more division than they do to bring people together. I should have slept a little longer. In 15, chapter 15. He says, you got to be in me. you got to be connected to me. you got to abide in me. you got to live in me. you got to move in me and have your being in me. Why am I saying this? Because you are important. He wants you to be connected with him. Because when you are connected with him, he will supply everything that you need. He will. That's who he is. But many times, even in my life, I've been more connected to my pain. I've been more connected to my past. I've been more connected to my feelings. I've been more connected to other people's opinions. I've been more connected to my failures. I've been more connected to my successes. A lot of times we're more connected. And we have to be connected to Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to feed on Him and be connected to Him and feast on Him. You know why? This is going to sound contradictory if I said that right. Church is not your answer. Jesus is. Jesus is. Because there's a lot of people that hop from church to church trying to find something that no church will never give them, no pastor will never give them, no program will never give them, no new smell of carpet will ever give them that will never give them. That the latest and greatest thing for their children will never give them. Why? Because our children even need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And church is not the answer. Jesus is the answer. And that's what he's saying in John 15 here. He says, you've got to abide in me. Why? Because if we are in Him, we are in victory. If we are in Him, we are in victory. Why? Because Jesus is the victorious King. I got so many scriptures. We're just going to have to unplug. Let me say this as I close. I'm not mad, I'm passionate about this move of God in the earth. And you know why I'm passionate about it? Because it's not about people and stuff, and it's not about how good my sermons are or not. It's not about music. It's not being the, the latest and greatest, and everybody's watching me on YouTube, because ain't nobody watching me really, but you know what I'm saying? The Lord is. That's what matters. It's not, it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not about all that stuff. It's about people experiencing the true God. Why did God bring me back to the community that I was born and raised in? Because God put a passion in my heart. The people of this community and beyond all over the world will experience not religion, but the true God. And what it takes is us going deeper. Somebody shout deeper. deeper. It takes us going deeper, but many times we're okay on the surface. I've shared this a long time ago, and I don't know where I heard this, but this is what I'm going to close with. God is calling us deeper. I'm going deeper. I, I'm going deeper. Not, not everybody wants to go deeper. I, 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 am going, I am going deeper. And I believe that there are four levels. I've shared this before. I think I was taught this when I was in ministry school. I can't remember where I got this. This is not original with me. They said it a little bit deep. Uh, they said it a little bit different. Uh, I think they said maybe there's four levels of commitment possibly. But as I was thinking about this and praying this week, I felt the Lord told me there's four levels to the depth of the body of Christ. And the first level in the body is this. It is the crowd. There, the, the crowd has gone to a certain level. You know what the crowd does? They come and they see. 
They don't participate. They just say, hey, man, you know, uh, that church over there is cool. I can sit on the back. Nobody, nobody will see me. I don't have to make much commitment. Man, it's a big church. I can get lost in the crowd. There's nothing wrong with big church. I went to ministry training school at a church that had almost 15,000 people in it through all their services. There's nothing wrong with big church. That's not what I'm saying. But the crowd wants to come and see and leave. That's a level. If you're at that level, God's not mad at you, but he's calling you to another level. Will you hear the call to another level? The first level is the crowd. The second level is the congregation. Oh, yeah, I'm a part of that congregation. The congregation, what do they do? What do, they, do? they come and they join. I'm going to join in with this congregation. I'm a part of the congregation. They come and they join. If that's where you are and you've joined yourself to this house, that is good. That is good. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm saying there is another level. And the next level, we like to say it like this. The next level is the core. Man, they are a part of the core. You know what the core does? The core comes and serves. And some people say, well, all they want you to do there is work. All they want you to do there is get involved. But Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, you must become the servant of all. And servant, servanthood goes beyond these walls. It goes outside these walls into the community. But what happens is some people come to the level that they're going to get involved in the core. They come and they serve. If you're at that level, thank the Lord. But there's very few people that go to this next level. And this level is called the commissioned. You're not just part of a crowd. You're not just part of a congregation. You're not just part of a core. You are a part of the commission. Commission? Commissioned by who? Commissioned by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you know what the commissions do? They don't just come and see. They don't just come and join. They don't just come and serve. They come and die. I know people say, die, man. What are you talking about? Nobody wants to die. I'm not talking about dying in the natural. I'm talking about dying to the flesh that you may live according to the Son of the living God. And the commission say, you know what? I will not be offended. Why? Because I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man in my flesh, in my feelings, in my circumstances, but I'm alive in the Spirit. And I will love those that persecute me. I will bless those that talk bad about me. I will pray for those. And even if I see them in a pinch or a pickle, I may not want to go out and do business with them. But if I see them in a pick and a pinch or a pickle and a pinch or whatever it is, and they need some help, I am dead to my own ways. And I will extend the hand of Jesus. Because even when I was dead in my trespasses, Jesus extended a hand to me. It was a hand of love. It did not judge me. It did not look at me funny. It reached down and picked me up out of the muck and the mire. And God is looking for a church and a people and a body and a bride that is come and they are commissioned that they die to everything else but the will of the Father. Going deeper into the levels that God is taking us.